Let us begin with a short prayer. Father, we praise you and we thank you for your action in our lives and in the world. And we ask that we may be fully involved this year in Holy Week so that we may allow these ceremonies to form us further in your image. We ask this in the name of Jesus, the Lord. Now, if you remember, um, this week what we're going to do is start a uh, look at the history of the, uh, actually, the Eucharistic liturgy. And I'm using a book by Edward Foley, and the title of the book is From Age to Age. The, uh, it's a kind of expensive book. Uh, I think it's $30. But it's, uh, if you're interested in the topic, it's really well done. It's well is illustrated. It's a really interesting book. So having said that, we'll start. I'm going to begin with Alexander, who uh, in the year 323 uh, conquered the area of Palestine. And uh, he founded a huge city there. And the name of the city is Sephoris. Um, the first time I went to Israel, people knew that city was there, but no one knew where it was, and they couldn't find it. But since then, they have found it. And uh, if you go to Israel today, I'm sure you'd go see the ruins. But as far as the ruins go, the only more spectacular ruins I've ever seen are Ephesus. The center road of the town is half again as wide as this church is, and it's marked by marble columns all the way down. And it's set out typical Greek style. Uh, it was, uh, uh, it's divided into quadrants. The center of the city has a temple and formal buildings, and, but it, it, it's Greek style. And what uh, Alexander did was when he went around to these different places he conquered, he left little groups of Greeks and had them design the city and set it up and, and they built it out of what they looted in the area. And they built these uh, Greek cities. Alexander was convinced that once people had contact with Greek culture, then everything would follow that. And he was right. So that um, even today, our cities are laid out in quadrants where you can. Uh, we have certain things in the center of the city. A Mexican village is the best example. You have a church, you have the government buildings, you have a plaza, and the town goes out in these quadrants. So, but anyway, so he considered himself primarily an apostle of Greek culture. And this was one of the cities he founded. Why is that important? That's important because Nazareth is a suburb of Sephoris. And when we think of Nazareth, and when I think of the way I was trained in uh, movies and everything, it seems like a little backwater town where uh, a group of peasants are living and they have palm branches on top of their houses to do it. That was not true. Nazareth was a city. And Nazareth was not huge, but it was a suburb of this huge city. And Nazareth, and that area um, in the days of Jesus were one of the most populous areas in the entire Roman Empire. It was very, very strong. Now, Jesus living there would be a fully Hellenized Jew. His religion would be Jewish, but his culture and everything would be Greek. That's the way it was set. So he would be a Hellenized Jew. Um, Jesus, as a result of that, would have known how to read and write. In fact, today, we consider that area of the world to be one of the most literate in the world at this time. I'll tell you a story of a, a, uh, one of the tells where they go through uh, uh, excavating. Uh, if you want to go over in the summer in uh, Israel, particularly, uh, you can get on one of these things and be involved in the excavations. Uh, you don't have to have any background. They give you the training necessary and they watch over everyone very carefully. And what you find, you give to them and you, 
they go through in set sections and stuff. It's a, it's a very organized thing, but you don't have to have great qualifications to do it. You have to be very attentive and do what you're told, but not great qualifications. One of the things they used to find all over Israel, uh, they still do it, are pieces of pottery with lettering on them. And uh, they've always just kept them when they find them and this sort of thing. But anyway, one year, out of the United States, there was a fourth grade teacher, and she went to work on the tell. And she found one of these. And the, uh, the man who was in charge, uh, she said, I think I found something. And he said, okay, and he says, what is it? She says, it's a pottery shard. And he says, okay, like it wasn't a whole pot she was gonna get out, but a chip of pottery. So he says, okay, you can get it out. He, as she was getting it up, uh, he says, what does it look like? And she says, it's another one of these writing exercises. He says, writing exercises? Because she taught kids to write, she recognized this is the way you teach people to do letters. And so they came to understand that any time a pot was broken or something, the broken piece of the pot was used by children to learn their writing. To get, what, that indicated just how widespread writing and reading were in the area. So Jesus was what you might call a fully Hellenized Jew. And uh, the influence of Judaism and Hellenism will unite in the Christian community. And the reason they unite is because the Jews form the initial thing but the people they're converting, the Jews they're converting, a lot of them are Hellenized Jews, and the other people, the non-Jews, would be all Hellenized in the area. So in the early Christian community, we find this Hellenistic culture and the Jewish uh, community. When we read uh, the Gospel account of Mark, there are several quotes from Jesus that are like, for instance, when he's on the cross, Elwi, Elwi, Laba Sabachthani, which is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's Aramaic, and that is what Jesus would have spoken. That's probably a direct quote from Jesus. Uh, another one is where he raises a girl who's uh, thought to be dead, a young girl. He says, Talitha kum, and again, that's Aramaic, forget up. And so what we see is that by the time the earliest gospel is actually put down, and that's Mark, by the time the earliest gospel is put down, already the dominant language is Greek. The four gospel accounts are all in Greek. The New Testament, all in Greek, okay? So Greek was the language. The only time they used the Aramaic was when they were remembering a direct quote from Jesus, and they would put that down. Um, Jesus in his lifetime, this, uh, this, what do you call that, uh, study, he divides into different things. And so the first thing he's going to talk about basically is the buildings, okay? So he said that Jesus would have traveled to the temple many times in his life, and it would remain the center of worship for the early Christians. Um, we have, uh, particularly in John's account, many stories of what happened when Jesus was in Jerusalem. And we have the story as a child at the age of 12 is going. But Jesus' involvement with the temple would have been very, very important. Uh, I remember the very first time I went to Jerusalem. I went to Jerusalem um, probably 19, maybe 1974, and uh, 74 or 75. And when I went to Jerusalem, uh, we stayed in a hotel, and I went on an entirely Jewish tour. And when I was there, you know, I got up very early in the morning and walked over to the Church of the Holy Sepulcher, and I went to Mass there. In fact, I said Mass there every single day while I was in Jerusalem. And why? It's because of your, it's the Holy Sepulcher. I don't think I need to say anything else to a Christian. But you know, the same thing would be true of a Jew. If you were a Jew in Jerusalem for any purpose at all, you went to the temple every day. And just to see it and just to know you were in the temple. So Jesus was in the temple 
constantly. And what's recorded in the Acts of the Apostles is that in the early church, the Christians would go to the temple for regular worship, and after the worship in the temple, they would go back to a home, and in the home, they would celebrate the sacrament of the bread and wine, okay? Now, something to know about this, and we're going to see this as we go on, um, that practice did not continue in the church. Uh, I think if it had, the beginning part of our service would be an animal sacrifice, but that wasn't the way it worked, so that was not part of our, our, our tradition. But what, what happened was, with the destruction of Jerusalem, the community in Jerusalem, the Christian community, was scattered and the temple was gone. So that was the end of that. Our community is descended from the community in Nazareth and Capernaum, and they didn't have the temple. Okay, so the temples in Jerusalem. During the Babylonian captivity, for seven years, 70 years, the Jews were imprisoned as slaves in Babylon. And while they were there during the Babylonian captivity, synagogues began. And synagogues at that time weren't buildings, they were just gatherings. Remember the Jews, most of them there were slaves. And so what they would do is gather. Now when they gathered, they couldn't do the worship that you would find in the temple. So a synagogue initially is not a place of worship. A synagogue is, in fact, a, uh, a school. And so they would go there to study and listen to the, uh, the, uh, the readings. Now, in Nazareth, obviously, they would have a synagogue and they would not have a temple, okay? Uh, one of the reasons why they didn't is that um, God forbid the Jews to ever have more than one temple. He discovered very early if the Jews had more than one place to worship, they would begin to think they had two gods. So God said no, there could only be one temple. And uh, while there were sacrifices in the temple, there is actually no indication anywhere in scripture that sacred scripture was read as a regular part of the services in the temple. We have certain things like in Elijah, uh, in uh, Ezra, Nehemiah, where there's the reading of the text. And we have a couple of instances where texts are read to the Jews as part of a worship thing. But that is not part of the temple worship. So scripture really wasn't there. Um, however, uh, the one thing that would be used were psalms. The book of Psalms as we know it, the book of Psalms became a regular part of the worship in the temple. And uh, uh, probably many of them were sung there. Uh, one of the ways of dealing with uh, the Psalms, I think you're familiar with the Psalms, but I think you know the Psalms, there are, are different verse structures, different verse lengths and stuff like that. And so you can't take a particular piece of music, like Edelweiss, and put the Psalms to it. You, you simply can't do that. And what they used to do with the psalms is what we call cantalization or cantillation. And cantillation is sort of a cross between talking and, and speaking. And uh, so they would, they would sort of musically go through the psalm, but not to any set formula. And, uh, and these then were used in worship. Uh, eventually, in the synagogue, they evolved a service. And how did they evolve a service? It's just that as they were studying the scriptures, then they started formal things, like you would stand for the reading of the scriptures. You would sit down for the explanation. You would say a prayer before you read the scriptures. You would say a prayer and then bless the book, and you would bless the people at the end. You'd say a prayer that God cleanse you. But these little prayers they had began to seep into the synagogue so the synagogue began more and more to resemble worship, but it was not a place of worship. Worship was considered in the temple. Synagogues then 
were at very, very simple buildings, okay? A synagogue as it began when they get back to Israel, you know, in Babylon, Babylon they didn't have the synagogue buildings. When they came back to Israel, they began to have uh, the synagogue buildings. And initially, they were very simple buildings, like a square room, and the scriptures would be read there. The buildings will become very formalized over a long period of time, but initially, that's what happened. They would focus. The second thing that happened in those buildings was the development of a Torah shrine. The Torah is the first five books of the Bible, and they were on scrolls. And so eventually, they developed a shrine, and you'll notice it very prominently in synagogues today. And those shrines were used to house the uh, copies they had of the Torah. Now remember, a copy of a book like that would be priceless. It had to be written by hand, it had to be written according to certain formulas and this sort of thing. So Torahs were and are priceless. And uh, even today they're written by hand, even today they're on scrolls, and even today it's on uh, animal skins, it's on leather. So that, that's all done that way. These, uh, if, if you think of a Torah shrine, think in your mind of a very large tabernacle. Uh, and it would have that kind of prominence. They would see it as prominent when you go in. It's usually about three feet wide and maybe five to seven feet high. They have a tabernacle like that if you ever get a chance to go to St. Mary's Cathedral in San Francisco. But in there, their tabernacle is a big thing like that. And so that began to evolve in the buildings. Outside Jerusalem, uh, Christian life evolved around the synagogue in the early days. I'm talking uh, at this period of history from the year, from the death of resurrection of Jesus up to the year 100 in that period there. And so um, for Christians, all outside of Jerusalem, their whole lives then evolved around the synagogue. In Jesus' day, the temple was for worship, the synagogue for study, and the home for prayer. And if you think about it, um, when we think of prayer, we think of petitions and things like that. There wasn't a lot of that in the temple. Uh, the prayers prayed for the good of Israel, and that sort of thing, but they, they weren't a big thing. The big place of prayer for the Jews is the home. And in Jewish tradition, like every meal is kind of a sacrament. There's certain prayers you say before, and I think you know there's rituals about what you can eat, what you can't eat, it's all. But if you think of prayer in Judaism, think of the home. When you think of worship, actually worshiping God, think of the temple. When you think of study, think of the synagogue. Now, so once the temple is gone, we notice that the synagogue becomes more and more a place of worship. Um, many of the home prayers would gradually work their way into the synagogue service over a period of time, but this didn't happen in the days of Jesus. This followed Jesus. Um, after the resurrection and ascension of Jesus, the life of the Christian community continued to evolve around the temple and the synagogue. If you were in Jerusalem, it revolved around the temple. If you were outside of Jerusalem, and again, the two major communities were Nazareth and Capernaum. But if you were in them, they evolved around uh, the synagogue itself. The only worship that took place uh, elsewhere was the Eucharist, which was celebrated in a home after a visit to the temple or the synagogue. So the Christians, our worship service became the uh, sharing of the bread and wine, the consecrated bread and wine. And uh, it, it would take place, and I told you in Jerusalem, they would go to the temple. In uh, this, the areas like Nazareth, they would go to the synagogue. And when the synagogue service came, then they would go to a home and celebrate the sacrament of the bread and wine. Now remember at this point, no Christian considered themselves anything other than a Jew. 
And I think you know that in the, in the early days, there's a council, the very first of the ecumenical councils, it's called the Council of Jerusalem, it appears in the Acts of the Apostles. And one of the things the council's doing is trying to figure out just how Jewish you have to be to become a Christian. See, the Jews, as they converted, were Jewish. But when they were bringing Gentiles in, there were certain things they had to avoid. They couldn't eat meat that had blood in it and stuff like that. But there was, there was a series of rules in order to find out just how Jewish they had to be to somehow come into the synagogue. So we, we see this now, the Eucharist is in the home. This had a tremendous influence on the early Christian gathering because both the temple and the synagogue could be considered male space. So if you look at the temple, there's a, a boundary beyond which Jewish women may not go and men can go inside and this sort of thing. Um, in the synagogue, it was a man who did the readings. It was a man who did the teachings. And you see this, this uh, what do you call it, this, this distinction uh, between those being male areas. However, in the Greco-Roman world, the home was considered a female area. And this led to the fact of very strong female leadership in the church at this time. And this was particularly in the area of worship. Um, it, I think you could say that it was undoubtedly true that often, and I think probably more often than not, the one who led the Eucharistic service was a woman. And that, that's where it would take place in the, the home. And uh, you, those of you who are interested in this sort of thing, if you have studied the, uh, the letters of Paul, you remember that Paul forbids a woman to teach men and will begin a series of things uh, very, you know, against women you find in the Pauline uh, texts. And this is, uh, you know, it, it, it sounds kind of strange because Paul himself says there's no male, there's no female, there's no free, there's no slave, you know, the idea that we're all equal. And yet he'll have this whole list of things about women. And many people believe that Paul was trying to correct this over-involvement of women in the liturgy at this point, okay? Now, whether or not that's true, I don't think anyone can, can say for sure. At this point, there was absolutely no development of special places for the Eucharist. It was just in a home. And there was no development of specific articles for the Eucharist. Like, for instance, they didn't have chalices, they didn't have patents, they didn't have this sort of thing. I would presume in a home, they used the best cup they had, and they used the best plate, and that's the way they would celebrate the Eucharist. While the temple and the synagogue would both be considered male space, um, the leadership of women in worship became very, very important, particularly in the early Christian communities. Now, because God is everywhere, prayer could be offered everywhere, and there was absolutely no motivation to create special locations or buildings for worship. The key to the location for worship was the people and not the building. And I should tell you that the word synagogue actually means gathering. Over a period of time, it came to mean the building. The word in English, when synagogue is translated rather into Greek, is ekklesia, that becomes the word church in English. So originally, the word church referred to the gathering. And, uh, Historically, they have tried many times to get Catholics not to refer to the building as a church, but to refer to the gathering of people as a church, and that the building they call a home for the church, okay? But we're so used to calling it a church, every time they've done that, it has kind of just fallen apart, okay? So the idea of worship was, was done everywhere, um, the Eucharist was celebrated in a, a home, not so much considered a 
uh, an act of worship at the time, probably. It was just the way the thing. Music for liturgy is another issue that is really difficult to explain. We touched on it a little when we talked about the Psalms, but we make a clear distinction between reading, speaking, and singing. And there was no such distinction in the ancient world. If, if you were a person who was going to read publicly, you would be a person who would know how to read publicly and in the, um, what do you call it, in the reading, you would veer off on your own two or three, much like I do here. You veer off on your own to a story and stuff like that. So you had the, the reading, you had the things you said, and you would also in sometimes use a sing-song type voice. In other times, you would actually incorporate a piece of music into what you were doing. So these were, were three things, but they, the three separate things were not distinguished in the ancient world. Um, I, I, I've shared this sometimes. I don't know if I've shared it here at all, but I once was involved, I, I have some friends in uh, Cairo who are Christians. Uh, I think Marianite Christians, but anyway, they're Christians. They uh, live in Cairo. And one time when I was in Cairo, they asked if I would like to go to a, uh, a reading, a presentation. And I said, sure. And it was going to be a reading of the Koran. Now, I almost canceled going when I found out that because I would like to sit through a reading of the Bible. I don't like to sit and have someone read to me. That, that is anything. But anyway, I'd, I'd agreed to go and everything, and so I, uh, I went. And uh, this woman, who I found out is famous all over the world for doing this, but this woman came in, and there was a big, what we call a comfy chair, big, huge, comfy chair in the center of the stage. This big, huge woman comes out, and she settles into this comfy chair and she opens the Koran. I have no idea whether it was the beginning or the middle or wherever she was. And she began to go through this reading that was a melodic reading in, uh, in cadences and everything. It is one of the most beautiful things I ever heard in my life. And I didn't understand a single word. But it's just beautiful the way they play with the notes and stuff like that. And uh, Arabic, uh, much like uh, Italian, is uh, a language that, because they're ending in vowels a lot of times, it's very easy to do that. You can't do, English is a clipped language like German, but it's just, it's there. But Italian and uh, uh, the, the, most of the Romance languages, but Arabic is the same way. It has a very melodic move to it, as I might add is Hebrew, but uh, the one I heard was in Arabic. In public readings, people would move very easily between reading, speaking, and singing. And in the days of Jesus, the temple had about 300 professional musicians, and they were be singers and musicians, and they were professionals. They were well-trained, and they were to accompany the services that went on in the, uh, in the temple. Uh, the introduction of music into liturgy uh, was probably the work of King David. Uh, when David, if you remember, David was a shepherd. And uh, one of the things that shepherds did when they led sheep, that in the Mideast, you get sheep trained to the sound of your voice. Now, Jesus in the scriptures, I say that uh, my, the people who follow me know my voice. Well, that comes from a shepherding thing. When a, a ewe would give birth to a lamb, the shepherd would take the lamb and he would carry the lamb. Oftentimes you see pictures of them around the neck, they could do that, but a, a lamb is very light, a baby lamb. So however it is, they would carry it for a few days. It would go to the mother simply to eat. Other than that, they kept the lamb with them. So the lamb was trained to the voice of the shepherd, not to the bleat of the mother. 
in a, a regular lambs today, the lamb and the mother find one another by the mother's bleat. But they wanted to train them to the voice of the shepherd. So, uh, so that was done. And David apparently sang. And so when he got uh, as king, uh, he began to introduce singing in the temple. Oftentimes we see pictures of David with kind of a harp instrument. And the, they, had, they had harps uh, of several different forms. They had uh, several uh, wind instruments. And of course they brought from the synagogue the chauffeur. And the chauffeur is, uh, depending on, you can have it small or really large, but the chauffeur is the horn from a sheep or a goat. The long ones that you see twisted come from a goat, but the short ones are all from sheep. And they would use those. So those gradually came into the uh, liturgy. The chauffeur, incidentally, had been used in the temple even before David was a way to announce when the priest came in or something like that. They didn't use, like for instance, at the liturgy today, we use a piece of music called an entrance piece of music. They did not. They just blew the chauffeur, and then you knew uh, it was uh, time to begin. In time, a lot of instruments were added as customs began to change. But the addition of instruments, you know that um, when, we, when we talk about, uh, let's say, a, a harp, you and I know a harp as a wedge-shaped thing. It's very thick. But in the ancient world, harps were what a person constructed. So someone may have 20, uh, what do you call, strings on it. Some person have two strings. So instruments, we, we can speak of stringed instruments. We can't really call it a harp. And we can speak of wind instruments, but we can't call it a trumpet or something like this. The one thing we would know is the chauffeur. But other than that, um, we, we wouldn't uh, know much about uh, the kinds of instruments. The main component of temple music was the Book of Psalms. And though there is some evidence that non-biblical texts were also used, uh, mainly the Psalms were a part of it. Now remember that in the temple they did not have the Torah. It wasn't there to study the Torah and stuff like that. But the Book of Psalms they did use. And the Book of Psalms, um, the way the Book of Psalms was composed, uh, initially, as people were using different music in the, the uh, temple, someone decided to put it together in a book. And when they put it together on a scroll, rather, when they put it together on a scroll, remember, it was stabilized, okay? Now, I think of this with... Um, the musical hair. I've seen the musical hair a dozen times, and the, the lyrics are never the same. And it's because they try and deal with contemporary problems and the thing. So the lyrics change in uh, different situations. But that's the way music was until it was written down. Once the psalm was written down, then the words and things did not change. Well, as soon as that was done, then people began also to compose new songs, everything out here, and they were very fluid until that was written down. Actually, in the book of Psalms, there are five separate books, and as one would be stabilized, this other one would be building up, and they built through, but the five books were put together. And when we talk about temple worship at this time, we're talking about the period while these texts are being put together. Don't think of this book of Psalms as like in your Bible at this time. So these things are gradually coming together. In the temple, all music was the domain of professionals. The congregation didn't sing. There was none of that at all. It was the domain of professionals. They were paid musicians who lived and worked in the temple. In synagogues, it was very different. Services were conducted by townspeople, both men and women. So the synagogues, it was uh, women would conduct services as well in the, in the synagogue. And uh, in the, the synagogue, the, uh, the music, the gathering would include men, women, and children. 
Uh, remember, there's no priests in the synagogue. The priests are in the temple in Jerusalem. There was no need for priests because they had no sacrifice in the synagogue. So these people would be gathering in the synagogue. They did not have professional singers. They did not have professional people going on. After the fall of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, things changed dramatically. The synagogue, not the temple, became the formal site of worship because the Jews no longer had the temple to worship in. And these synagogues were flooded by professional worshipers, uh, professional musicians who'd fled from Jerusalem. So now think of before this point of kind of like a birthday party or something in your home where we all get together and sing different songs and that sort of stuff and had nothing to do with professional or performance or anything. Now these people come out of the temple who are used to performing. And when they come to uh, the, the uh, synagogue, uh, what we're gonna see develop is uh, where a professional will sing something and then the, the community will sing back either the same verse or respond in something else. But it becomes much more formalized. But because in the synagogue, everyone is used to singing, they will not give everyone up as singers. And because in the temple we have professional singers, now we have leaders for the whole thing. And, and we sort of uh, put it together, together that way. Um, there are, uh, 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 in the synagogue, the distinction between music and speech had become blurred. And there seemed to be only two visible elements to the synagogue service. And by visible element, formal elements rather, there are only two really formal elements. One is the Shema, which is the classic prayer of the Jews. Hear, O Israel, you have one God, one God alone. And the other is Amada, which is called the standing prayer. Uh, it's administered standing. And it consists of 18 benedictions. Incidentally, this uh, 18 benedictions uh, tended to be, uh, would change, much like our prayer of the faithful, for instance. The Shema would be chanted by everyone. Everyone knew the prayer by heart. The Amada would be chanted by a professional because it, us used, it utilized an unfixed nature or an unfixed sequence of these blessings. While the Psalms were sung in the temple, in the synagogue, there were readings. They didn't necessarily see the uh, book of Psalms as their book. Cantillation is a way of chanting that employs a series of melod melodic formulas and sc the scrolls containing the words would be marked with signs to indicate where the melody was and that sort of thing. If you ever have seen old pieces of music from a monastery, they'll be in Latin and you'll notice marks above them. Uh, that's exactly where you break in the melody and how the melody forms. And that's for different length lines and stuff like that. If you have ever listened to Gregorian chant from a monastery, that's cantalization. Okay, that when we were doing Gregorian chant in the seminary, we'd have pages of music and there would be lines to tell us when we changed the tune as you went through. There, it'd be closer together in a short line, further apart in a long line. But that's called cantalization. Temple worship completely formed the imagination of the early Christians. But the music of temple worship had absolutely no effect on the early Christian community. And remember in the fall of uh, Jerusalem, uh, the destruction of the temple, the Christian community has ceased to exist in Jerusalem. And the communities that were in Nazareth and Capernaum are the ancestors of our church today. That's the ancestors. Um, if we are looking at the principal influence on early Christian music, we have to look to the home where the Christian element of their worship took place around the table. One of the things we're going to discover 
is that ultimately on our worship, as we celebrate it in the Catholic Church today, the big influence is not the Jewish temple and the big influence is not the synagogue. The big influence is what took place in the home, which was the blessing of the bread and wine. And so they pulled elements out of the uh, uh, temple, for instance, the more formalization of music and the reading of scripture that came out of the synagogue. Those were put together, but they were put together around the Eucharist and that became the major uh, element uh, in, our, in our tradition. Home music was principally blessings and prayers that would be chanted at the meals. Like if you know a Jewish family or something, um, they know, and if they don't know them by heart, they have them written down and know how to sing them. But they know the blessings that you use at Passover. They know blessings to begin a meal. They know blessings that can conclude a meal. They know things you pray for and stuff. Those things are all well known in the Jewish home. And that is where our liturgy uh, began to uh, come together. It's possible that another influence would be the social meals of the Greek symposium. Uh, Greek symposiums were very common, but were for the very, very wealthy. Now, if you were a singer, you could well be hired to be at a symposium. If you weren't, you could well be hired to be a waiter or something at a symposium. So I, I want you to know that first of all, symposiums were for extremely wealthy people and they were integrated into Greek culture. But many people who didn't have any money at all could well uh, witness it. I remember in San Francisco, uh, people who had real loves of opera as well as friends of mine who really loved movies, would get jobs as ushers in movie theaters and stuff like that. So they could t attend it all, even though they didn't have the money to go to the opera. They could attend all the operas that way. So anyway, um, understand that this symposium would be known. Uh, they were very elaborate, very elaborate. They were clearly orchestrated. They included music, a formal meal, and sort of a, a, a symposium in which they would discuss ideas and this sort of thing. And uh, wealthy Greeks joined the community. They would bring that influence to a meal as important as the Eucharist. So now you see this, what originally starts with this little um, goblet of wine and plate of bread at this table begins to see the influence of, of a huge elaborate meal. And we will watch as we begin to come out of the uh, thing in Jewish community and become a community ourselves, we'll watch that we take basically this, the, uh, the meal and it'll become more formal so that in our own day, by law, the inside of the goblet has to be gold. And I mean, it's very strict laws on all this stuff now that would sound outrageous to these people. But as, as they came in, these things began to be part of it. Variations on both Jewish and Greek chants and odes began to develop, creating distinctive musical forms and melodies that would be used in the beginning would be the beginning of the Christian music that would de develop in later centuries. Over a period of time, uh, probably the most uniquely Christian thing is uh, the uh, chanting uh, in monastic chanting. And, but we'll watch, watch these things and how, how they inform. There appears to be a very strong influence for responsorial music, much rather than solar, solo expressions of music. So that in a gathering, you wouldn't ordinarily have a performance, but oftentimes you would have this responsorial thing where they'd sing one and, and we'd sing another. Certainly there were some very talented singers in each community who might sing one or two solos, but solos did not dominate the liturgy. Um, it, it's really interesting to watch this. 
Because remember, this comes primarily out of the home, so it's put that way. But when I was a youngster, that a Sunday mass would be sung by a choir up in a choir loft, and they would have some solos and stuff like that. But we as the congregation were not that in the uh, Eucharistic liturgies. It's interesting in liturgies that weren't, you know, the mass and stuff like that, we were, uh, we sang uh, benedictions, we all knew the songs and that sort of thing, and, and May services, rosaries, we all knew the music and stuff like that, Marian music, that sort of thing. But the idea of the community singing in a mass was lost uh, at the time that I began. It was reclaimed, that it's been reclaimed more and more, but you oftentimes find congregations that would rather have a choir. And listening to choirs is, is beautiful, but you have to be very careful that liturgy never becomes a spectator sport. I'll tell you that when I look back on my own life, my real interest in the liturgy began when I made First Communion, and largely because I could start to serve Mass. And so when you're involved in the ceremony one way or another, it's a very, very different thing than you're just sitting and watching. Anyway, we will uh, stop it there and pick it up there next week. As we go through this, we're going to be discussing the setting, which is the building. We'll discuss the service itself. We'll discuss music. And later on, we're going to get into the Torah and the Bible as they become part of the service itself. Thank you very much. Hope to see you next week. Oh, and. Uh, I think uh, I, I think Michael gave you his email if you wanted to to uh, have some input, and I would s certainly encourage you if you have some input about whether this is what you want or not. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time. <laughs>